Again, it's just so great uh, to be with you this morning, so thankful that we can come and celebrate our faith and celebrate life together on Sunday mornings. And, and it's a real joy for me to share with you uh, the word uh, from the scriptures this morning. We're going to continue on this uh, series that we began last week looking at some of the humor of the Bible. There's a lot of funny stories in the Bible. There's a lot of humor in the Bible. Sometimes we miss it because we're not looking for it. Sometimes we overlook it because we want Bible reading to be serious, and certainly it is serious, but there's a lot of funny stories, a lot of great humor in the Bible. But before we jump into our next story and, and uh, share a, a humorous perspective and point of view maybe together on a well-known story, I want to say something that, that, that maybe I need to say. For some, we'd be happy to hear the pastor say this, but I, I agree that we can only know in this life, we can only know what God chooses to reveal to us. Would you agree with that? Would you go that far? You know, the only thing we can know about God, the only experience we can have with God is what God chooses to reveal of Himself. And we know and we believe and the church has affirmed for hundreds of years that one of the chief ways God reveals Himself to us is through the Bible, through the Holy Scripture. Like somebody said, complaining that God never speaks to you without opening your Bible is like complaining that you never get a phone call without turning on your phone, right? It's craziness. We believe that God speaks to us through the words of Scripture, I have a high regard and high respect for the Word of God. And God has used this Scripture to change my life and to impact my life in many ways, and I thank God for the Scriptures. And yet, I do find many of the stories of the Bible humorous. Humor is a funny thing. Those of you who are grandparents know that if you tell a joke to your grandkids, they might not get it because humor sometimes is generational, right? And if your grandkids are fooling around and making, you know, they're laughing their heads off and you're looking at what they're doing, you're thinking, that's not funny at all, right? Humor sometimes is generational. Sometimes humor is also cultural. What's funny to a 21st century American may be a little different than what was funny to a, you know, second millennium before Christ Hebrew, right? Or to uh, someone, uh, you know, uh, someone living in Palestine in the, in the first century, highly influenced by Greek culture. Sometimes humor is lost in the cultural exchange. But let's see if we can find some humor in the Bible over the next few weeks. I know and believe that we can. Listen, a cheerful heart is good medicine. Would you agree with that? That's Proverbs 17, 22. A cheerful heart is good medicine. Turn to your neighbor and tell him that. A cheerful heart is good medicine. Now I want you to do it again with a huge smile, the cheesiest smile you can make. A cheerful heart is good medicine. All right? Good for you. That's true. A cheerful heart is great medicine. There's some great humor in the Bible. If you think about it, some of the stories in the Bible, many of the stories in the Bible are pretty funny. Think about both Abraham and Sarah laughing when they hear that they're going to have a child. Abraham is 99, Sarah is 89, and God says, you're going to have a child, and through that child, I'm going to start a whole new race of people. And they both broke up laughing. One of them laughed because they didn't believe, and one of them laughed because they did believe. Read the story, and you'll know which is which. But they both laughed when they were told by God that they're going to have a child. And the Bible throws in this little line uh, that, you know, I don't know how Abraham felt about this. It said, he's going to have a child, although his body was as good as dead, right? That's what it says. And so, I don't know, uh, hopefully Abraham didn't get offended by that. But anyway, uh, so Abraham and Sarah are going to have his child at 89 and 99. They both laughed at the hilarity of this situation. If you were 99 or 89 and God said, you're going to have a kid, you got a choice. You can either laugh or cry about that, right? <laughs> right? And they chose to laugh. There's a lot of funny stories in the Bible. Jesus laughed. He laughed at the self-righteousness of the Pharisees. Imagine the situation. Jesus is not only, he, Jesus is the embodiment of the righteousness of God, okay? And yet here's these little Pharisees running around, washing their hands and doing all these little ri rituals and laws, thinking that they are the self-righteous, you know, they're the righteous people of the day. That had to have brought a smile to Jesus' face. There were times when it, what he says to them, it sounds like he's, 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 he's saying what he's saying through laughter, saying, oh my goodness, you people think you're so righteous, and, and yet look at the acts of your life. It, it's, it's almost hilarious, the, the, the irony that I see in, in your life. So there's a lot of, of, of funny stories in the Bible. Remember when Jesus 
compares persistence in prayer to the widow and the unjust judge. It's a fantastic story. It's a, and I think Jesus told this with a smile on his face. He's talking about how important it is not to give up on praying. That just because you, know, you don't see the answer to a prayer immediately, keep praying. And he compares that to a widow who keeps nagging and pestering and pestering and pestering and pestering this unjust judge who would rather not even pay any attention to her, but she keeps pestering him till he just can't stand it anymore and he finally grants her request. And Jesus compares that to a disciple being persistent in prayer. Surely he did that with a smile on his face. If, if, that's, the case, if that's the case in the human, you know, human world, imagine how much more quickly the Father in heaven is going to respond to our prayers if we'll just remain persistent. There's a lot of great humor in the Bible. I think about the Apostle Paul and his comparison of the church to the human body. Remember that? In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, those of you in Disciple Bible Study know that we kind of close Disciple looking at, at our gifts. That all of us, the Bible says in, in 1 Corinthians 12, the Apostle Paul says that all of us are part of the body of Christ. The church is the body of Christ. We all have different functions because of our gifts. We're all gifted differently, so all of us have a different role to play. And he has this hilarious comparison to the human body arguing with itself over who's, you know, the, I don't need you, I don't, you know. And he talks about the hands don't need the feet. And, and, and in my mind, I'm thinking about these hands talking to the feet. Hey, feet, I don't need you anymore. Yeah, that's right. We don't need those feet. You hear that, feet? We don't need you at all. And the feet saying, hey, what do you think? Where do you think you're going to go without us, right? And then he says, hey, the, the ears don't need the eyes. And the ears say, hey, that's right, eyes, we don't need you. And the ear says, yeah, we don't need you at all. And the eye says, well, what do you think you're going to see without us, right? It's a funny story. And, and the Apostle Paul uh, gives this, this humorous, wonderful illustration to say that all of us are important. You might be the hand in the body of Christ. You might be the foot. You might be the eyeball. You might be the ear. Uh, and who knows, you might be something else. But uh, whatever you are in the body of Christ right? Whatever you are in the body of Christ. Uh, I had a, I had a, forgive me, I had a guy that was always, you know, bringing up the butt in, uh, in, in, in the meetings. He's always saying, you know, yeah, but. If someone said, we can do this, yeah, but. I know God's calling us to do this, yeah, but. And so we decided he was the backside of the body of Christ. Right? <laughs> so, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's almost hysterical to think about how, how Paul talks about the human body, com comparing the body of Christ to the human body. There's a lot of funny stories in the Bible. The morning, th this morning, we're going to look at one that is a fantastic story, one of the most important in all the Bible. It's the story of God talking to Moses and calling him to go to Egypt to set the people free. It's an important story. Don't miss that. You know, if Christians view all of history through the lens of the death and resurrection of Jesus, which we do, right? What, what's, the, what's the key event in all of world history? The, the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, right? That's why we've divided in the West, we've divided all of time between B.C. and A.D., before Jesus came and after he's come, Anno Domini, the year of our Lord, that's what it means, Right? Christians view all of history through the lens of the cross. Well, if that's true, the Hebrew, our, our Jewish friends, tend to view all of history through the lens of the Exodus, the time when God freed the people from slavery in Egypt and drew them out to freedom to become his own nation, his own people. The story of the Exodus is, is paramount. The paramount story in all of the Old Testament. So God talking to Moses about being the deliverer of the people for the Exodus is a very, very important story, and yet it is really funny when you see it so. Moses has gone into retirement. The year is, uh, we'll say, 1260 B.C., give or take a century or two, like you do when you're talking about dates that old. The Hebrew people have been enslaved in Egypt for 400 years. They've been calling out to God, praying to God, crying out to God that, that they might be delivered from the cruel Pharaoh and from their tasks. God hears their prayers. And God designs to use a man named Moses. Anybody remember what his name means? It means literally drawn out. That's what the name Moses means because remember it was Pharaoh's daughter who drew him out of the Nile River. Remember the story. If you don't, you need to go back and read the first of Exodus, right? Remember the story. One of the great stories in all the Old Testament. 
This, this man whose name means literally drawn out is being called to go and draw the people out of Egypt and into freedom and to become God's new people, God's chosen people in a land of milk and honey. But what makes it funny, for me anyway, is how Moses argues about it <laughs> and how our, Moses, you know, imagine the God of the universe has a plan to change history and save millions of his people, and Moses says, I don't think so, God. <laughs> Can't you find somebody else? And when you hear the conversation, it almost becomes comical. So we're going to look at this story of when Moses runs into a burning bush, and his life is changed forever. Tongue in cheek, this, someone said that this is the time when Moses and God met, and Moses said, God, what is your name? And God said, I am that I am. And Moses said, no way. And God said, Yahweh. <laughs> so, we're going to pick up the story in Exodus chapter 4. And uh, so, Moses and the Lord have already met. He's seen the bush that's burning but not consumed. And now, let the arguing begin. Moses answered, suppose they don't believe me or listen to me, but say, the Lord didn't appear to you. The Lord said to him, what is that in your hand? Moses said, a staff. And he said, throw it on the ground. So Moses threw the staff on the ground, and it became a snake. And Moses drew back from it. And then the Lord said to Moses, reach out your hand and seize it by the tail. Wow, that was a challenging thing. So he reached out his hand, trembling, I suppose, and grasped it, and it became a staff in his hand, so that they may believe that the Lord, the God of their ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has appeared to you. Again, the Lord said to him, put your hand inside your cloak. And he put his hand inside his cloak, and when he took it out, his hand was leprous, as white as snow. Leprosy was a dreaded and feared disease in the ancient world. Then God said, put your hand back into your cloak. So he put his hand back into his cloak, and when he took it out, it was restored like the rest of his body. If they will not believe you or heed the first sign, they may believe the second sign. If they will not believe even these two signs or heed you, you shall take some water from the Nile and pour it on the dry ground, and the water that you will take from the Nile will become blood on the dry ground. But Moses said to the Lord, <laughs> My Lord, I've never been eloquent, neither in the past nor even now that you've spoken to your servant. I'm slow of speech and slow of tongue. And then the Lord said to him, who gives speech to mortals? Who makes them mute or deaf or seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go, and I will be with your mouth and teach you what you're to speak. But Moses said, O oh Lord, please send somebody else. Then the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. That's kind of funny. It's scary, but it's kind of funny. The anger of the Lord is kindled against Moses, and he said, and I, you know, I don't know if God speaks through his teeth or not, but if he does, he might have sounded like this. What of your brother Aaron the Levite? I know he can speak fluently. Even now he's coming out to meet you, and when he sees you, his heart will be glad. And you'll speak to him and put words in his mouth, and I will be with your mouth and with his mouth. I will teach you what you will do. He will indeed speak for you to the people. He will serve as a mouth for you, and you will serve as God for him. Take in your hand this staff with which you will perform the signs. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. What a great story this is of Moses and God arguing over whether or not Moses is going to go and do this thing that God wants him to do. If you think about it, the whole situation is rather hilarious and, and ludicrous. Here's Moses who's retired. He's shepherding some sheep, living with his wife in Midia you know, kind of just relaxed. He's kind of put life in coast for a while, and he runs into this burning bush, and his life has changed forever. And, and then Moses has the audacity to argue with the God of the universe. Can you imagine anyone ever arguing with God? That's funny, isn't it? <laughs> because point to yourself, 
point to me if you don't have anything else to point to. Haven't we all done that? But think about how dumb, how, how hilarious that is. Here's just me arguing with God over what God wants me to do. Uh, it's a little scary. It's a little sad, I suppose. It's a lot of things, but including funny. Here's this, this God of the universe talking to Moses, and Moses says, I know better than you do, Lord. I'm not your man, even if you think I am. So, God offers these holy gestures to Moses. I like that. When I was studying for this sermon, I, I, looked, I was reading a Hebrew scholar who said that the, these signs that God gave to Moses, the serpent and the leprous hand and the water from the Nile turning to blood, were like, he used the phrase, holy gestures. They're miraculous, but they're not so miraculous that they couldn't be resisted if Moses wanted to. Isn't that the way God often works in our lives? God will get your attention. He'll tap on your shoulder. He'll whisper in your ear. Maybe even arrange some circumstances or events in your life to get your attention. But in the end, if you're going to follow the Lord, it's going to have to be because you choose to and because you act in faith. Because God's never going to give you an irresistible sign. Every sign God ever gives can be resisted. If you don't want to believe it, if you don't want to view life through the lens of faith, you don't have to. God will give you some holy gestures in life, but that's what they are. They're holy gestures. You can take it or leave it. You can believe it or not. You can go God's way or you can choose to just walk away from it all. What holy gestures has God made to you lately? Pastor Jamie and I were praying a few weeks ago about something we know needs to happen, but neither, neither he nor I can figure out how to do it. And so we said, well, let's pray that God will raise up someone who can do this. That was on a Tuesday morning. Wednesday morning at McDonald's for worship, someone came to me, within 24 hours came to me and said, Pastor Ray, can you come by my office today? I was up all night last night. I got this feeling God wants me to do something, and I have no idea what it is. And I said, brother, I think I can help you. <laughs> You know, and you say, well, maybe, maybe not. Maybe that was just coincidence, maybe. But I think that might have been a holy gesture from the Lord that God is doing something. God's up to something. Secondly, when I look at this story, I think about this story and I'm reminded that this is a story about a God, a parent who loves his children very much. Don't misunderstand the story of the Exodus. Don't misunderstand this argument that Moses is having with God. This is not just the story of gods in conflict. Ancient literature is full of those kinds of stories. Most ancient epics and mythology is full of gods in gory combat. You know, who's the, who's the greatest? Who's the best God? You get some of that element in this, the God of the Hebrews or the God of the Egyptians. But this is way more than that. This is not just about a God who wants to show his dominance over another God. This is about a parent who's concerned for his children. That raises the stakes, doesn't it? How many of you are parents or grandparents? You know, we can talk about principles and we can talk about philosophies all we want to, but when your kids are in trouble, that changes everything, right? So here's God caring about his children who are in slavery in Egypt. It's not just about God showing his dominance over the Egyptians. God is worried and concerned for his children. And he knows that Moses is the right man for the job. Friends, we need to remember that when we're sharing our faith with others. It's not just about winning an argument. It's not just about sharing some philosophical debate with someone about whether there's a God that exists. There's a, there's a place for some of that. But in the end, what we, the good news we have to offer to our world is there is a God who loves you like a parent loves a child and is concerned for you and, and, and wants you as his own child and wants you to come home. That's what's at the center of our faith. Third, and I read this story, I think this is a story that teaches us that God can use anybody at any age, at any stage of life. Think about it. Moses has been, he's done with Egypt. He's run off from Egypt, if you know the story. He, he left Egypt 
in a hurry, went to Midia, got married to Zipporah, had a couple of kids in his old age, you know, he had a spring crop and a fall crop maybe, but he had some kids in his old age, and he's enjoying these children of his, he's enjoying his wife, living out in the country, and he's put everything in coast. Hmm. Uh, we went to see Jeff James at Restore Hope on Friday with the 5th and 6th graders. And he said, anytime you feel comfortable, look out. <laughs> Get ready. Because our call as followers of God, our call as followers of Jesus Christ is not to be comfortable. Moses has put it in coast. And all of a sudden he, 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 he encounters this burning bush and God has this huge call and claim on his life. Uh, that, should, that should speak to us. I don't know how many retired folks we have here this morning. Think about it. Moses was 80 years old, the Bible says, when this happened. He lived to be 120. So he was about two-thirds of the way through his life when he got this call. In other words, the greatest thing Moses would ever do with his whole life, he would do after retirement. The big thing that God was gearing him up for his entire life was going to happen in his latter years. It's important for some of us to hear that. Someone said to me once, don't retire, retread, right? The Bible is full of God using people in all ages and stages of life. We think about Josiah, the boy king of Judah, who was called to rule in Judah at eight years of age, all the way up to uh, Abraham, who was called to have a child at age 99. God can, will, and does use anyone at any age and stage of life. If you think it's over with, it's not. If you think it's still out there somewhere, it isn't. It's right now. Any age, stage, every life. Fourth, I think this is, this is kind of funny. God doesn't mind clunky arrangements. Let me explain that. So usually on Monday or Tuesday, Pastor Jamie, Pastor Stephen, BJ, uh, Joe Grubb, some of us get together and we talk about the message. I present the, I present the scripture, I present the basics of the message, kind of where we want to go in general, and then we talk about it. And we all add to you know, the message and talk about our own anecdotal information and some of the things that we might have to add to the conversation. And so we're looking at this story, and we're looking at how God tries to get tries to get Moses to do what he wants him to do by saying, okay, you can take your brother Aaron with you. And, and you can speak to Aaron, and Aaron will speak to Pharaoh, and you know, we'll, we'll, we'll arrange it that way. How many of you have ever been on a mission trip where you had to use an interpreter? That's kind of a clunky situation. Uh, we were in uh, Copper Canyon last year, and we had to use a couple of interpreters because we had to go, you know, we had to go from Taramaran to Spanish, then Spanish to, to English, and anyway, we had two or three interpreters, and Dr. Rob was trying to, you know, look at someone's eyes. It was kind of dark in the house, and, and we're going through a couple of different interpreters. There was an older person who only spoke Taramaran, and I was just praying to God that they were going to come out of there with some new glasses and, and not a kidney transplant, and, and, uh, <laughs> and, and so... You know, that's a clunky situation. That's what, that's what Pastor Stephen called it. He, he said, yeah, this, thing with, this thing with Moses and Aaron and Aaron kind of being, the, that's kind of a clunky arrangement, isn't it? And I said, yeah, it is. So what are we supposed to learn about that? I guess God is willing to use clunky arrangements. I got a few of those in my life. How about you? How often have we prayed that God would use us in some way and we said, yeah, but everything's not perfect. If God really wanted to use me, if God really wanted to work in this situation, then this would be different and that would be different and this person would be different. Mm -mm. That's not usually how it works. God is willing to go to work right now in and through you regardless of the clunky situation in your life. God is not afraid of clunky Arrangements, I, I like that phrase. That's a, that's a Pastor Stephen phrase. God is not afraid of clunky situations. He wasn't for Moses, he's not for us. Finally, and now we get serious. I, I've seen a lot of humor up to this point, but this is kind of serious. In the end, Moses is afraid that this call from God is going to cost him his life. That's why he's so hesitant to do this thing. He's afraid that this call from God is going to cost him his life, and he was right. 
Pharaoh didn't kill Moses, but Moses would spend the rest of his life following this supreme call of God, doing whatever it was God wanted him to do. Hmm. That sounds something like what Jesus said to the disciples. If you're going to follow me, take up your cross daily and follow me. I wish, you know, I wish I could find some way around that or some way to make that a little softer or something, but I can't. If you're going to be a person of faith, if you're going to be a God follower, if you're going to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, you've got to come to grips with that. It is a call that will cost your life. Perhaps not your physical death, but it will consume all of you to live out God's kingdom here on earth, to do the thing that God's calling you to do. So, in the end, here's some questions I was asking myself. How is God calling you? Has God been calling you for some period of weeks or months? Or I've known people who's, who, who know that God's been calling them for years, and they're still arguing. Are you still arguing with God? And maybe the third question is most important. Are you ready today to say yes to God and to take that first step, whatever it is, and oftentimes first steps are the hardest. Is God calling you to change the world? Or is God wanting to change you? Are you still making up silly excuses about why you can't do what the God of the universe has asked you to do? Make that phone call. Fill out that application. Dare to do the right thing. Love someone who's unlovable. Whatever it is God's calling you to do. And if you've heard that call, for heaven's sake, remain faithful. Keep going. Don't quit. No one ever said this was going to be easy. But somebody needs you. Somebody is still in Egypt. You can be sure that the Red Sea is going to part. The manna will come. And the promised land is just over the hill. Amen. If you're able, will you stand and let's pray together. Thank you, God, for your love and your grace. We thank you for this wonderful story of Moses the person you sent to tell the Pharaoh to let your people go. Lord, we find parts of this story pretty funny, mostly because we can see ourselves in the story, arguing with you. What a ridiculously funny thing to do. God, help us this morning to hear your voice clearly, to muster up all the faith that we need, to trust in you, to do whatever you're calling us to do in our lives. Maybe it's something really big, and maybe it's something so seemingly insignificant that no one else is even going to notice. But God, help us remember that those who are faithful in little will be faithful in much. And so, Lord, help us to hear your call, to go your way, to say yes. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And you may be seated.